this meeting will now come to order. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlin. Here. Vice Mayor Edwards. Here. Councilmember Finn. Here. Councilmember Binsbacher. Here. Councilmember Tenner. Here. Councilmember Dunn. Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of September 28th, 2021. We have one item on our study session agenda this evening as we continue our series on growth management. And tonight's subject is community design guidelines. And I will turn it over to our city manager, Jeff Tyne, to begin. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to speak to you yet again on another item that uh, is related to growth here in the city of Peoria. And again, as we continue to grow and evolve and revitalize, uh, we continue to look at ways that can affect the uh, quality of life for our residents. Tonight, that is a discussion on urban design. Urban design is much of the process of designing and shaping the physical features of a city. And so it can deal with, the, on a larger scale, buildings, infrastructure, streets, public spaces. The, this is important decisions that really can affect us in so many different ways because the sense of connectedness that we have as residents is a sense of uniqueness and aesthetics that we want in the, the, the space that's around us. So design, of course, is reflected in many of the elements of the development process, uh, which includes through the architectural aspects and the features there with our civil engineering and landscaping as well. Yet we're fortunate that we have an amazing plan planning and community development staff to help really amalgamate many of the discussions in this area. And so with that, I'll pass it first to our deputy city manager, Katie Gregory, who will also then make, uh, go through it and provide some further introductions. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Mayor and Council. This evening, or afternoon, late afternoon, I don't know what we are anymore. Um, I'd like, uh, Chris and I will be presenting on the, uh, and spending some time discussing with you the City's Design Review Standards, or as we like to have rebranded it, as the Peoria Community Design Guidelines. And I say this as why the change to a title like that? Um, and really it's because it's not just a check in the development review process. We don't just look at our design standards as something we just have to do as part of approving development as it goes through. Um, it really is an important uh, aspect of our review process where we are helping to create and form and mold a community. And some of the things that come in there, some of those are in other areas, but the, the things that kind of fall in the design review area are some of those things that really create that feel that you have when you enter a neighborhood, when you enter a commercial development, when you look at how Peoria feels when you enter into Peoria from other cities and things like that. So it's very important. Um, we'd like to share with you a little bit about uh, where this planning tool sort of fits in in the overall development process and how we use these guidelines. And just to be clear, many of these things, these are somewhat tough from time to time. Everybody's interpretation of what is um, desirable, what is expected, what is, um, you know, what is, what is good architecture, what is a good placement for things. Um, you know, everybody's vision is a little bit different and it requires a lot of what I'll call negotiation during the process as well. So there's some, some subjectiveness to it and, and we have to kind of recognize that as we move through the process. But we think that we have some solid principles and guidelines that we can share with you um, that have, some have been in place for a long time, others were just sort of refreshing. We're really taking a look at those and we want to go through that with you because these are the things that help with the overall form, fit and feel of the things that we see out in our development community. And then we wanna get some feedback with you um, related to some of the strength and language and the strength and uh, the concepts that we've, we've put in here. And ultimately, the refresh to this doc document will ensure that one, um, we're aligned with your council vision and goals, um, both on live or all on livability, on um, smart growth and on quality communities. And we also wanna make sure that it aligns with our goals and policies that we adopted as part of the general plan. And before I turn it over to Chris, I just wanna do a quick, um, and he'll do the lion's share of the presentation, I promise. Um, but I wanna start by sort of asking a question. And when you ask what makes a great community, um, you're gonna get a range of answers. Everyone has a vision of what that looks like. You're likely to hear answers ranging from seeing quality infrastructure, such as roads and parks, to feeling safe, right? A feeling of safety in our neighborhoods and in our, in our community, quality housing and commercial developments, 
family-friendly spaces. These are all things that we are hoping to create in Peoria and places um, that have ample and diverse employment opportunities. Those are big, big, big items that we all wanna see. And it's not just one thing, it's kind of the culmination of all these things that makes a community great. I do wanna say Peoria has a lot to be proud of. Um, as you can see here, you know, we have many of those best ofs um, that have, we've been recognized for. And you don't just, those aren't just given, those are earned. And, um, you know, best place to raise a family, best place to live in Arizona, all great accolades, and the, re the result of many efforts on the part of building a great community. However, we're not so bold to think that if we as a community don't embrace the changes that we're seeing, the changes in the values, the changes in the landscape of um, expectations of both our citizens and of our different uh, developments that are coming through the city, then we're gonna be left behind, and we know that, and we always are looking for ways to adapt. So, as John Wooden would say, you know, I know he was probably meaning this as a sports, you know, idea, but, you know, get a team to adapt, but we are a team, and we do need to adapt, and we do need to move forward. So, um, with that, I wanna just, um, I'd like Chris to walk you through kind of what some of the key elements of the document are, and when we're done, I would love to hear some of your feedback um, on some of the things and the changes that we're making. Well, thank you for that introduction, Katie. Um, and Mayor and Council, I, I really appreciate your time tonight. Um, you know, design review has been a, really been a labor of love. I guess I've been here long enough that I've seen the evolution of the document from its first edition. We're working on our third edition right now, so I've been here a while there, and I, and I, I can tell you that if you look at today's design review document, there's a picture in there of my son as a little kid climbing <laughs> on a sculpture. And uh, he's a lot older today, and I've got a little more gray hair today than I did back then, so um, certainly uh, happy to be working on this document here for you. Um, as Katie mentioned, it's, it's, um, it's, it's worth noting, we do have some, we do, uh, our design guidelines are very important. They, they directly pertain to the quality of life we have in the community. And, uh, and the, this council that, you know, you, you guys have sure placed a high, uh, high, uh, uh, high objective on quality development. It's also worth noting that we do, I believe, have some very good design standards in place today. They're comprehensive, and as we look at other documents, it's, it's among the most comprehensive I've seen. It always comes down to execution, though, right? And, and I can tell you we have a very good, dedicated professional staff. Um, they're, um, you know, they have to make professional judgments on sometimes policies that have a lot of room for discretion and interpretation. They have to do that. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's tough work, and oftentimes there might be multiple solutions to a design question. And sometimes the design solutions might be imperfect, but it's the, it's the world we work within in design review. But certainly, as Katie mentioned, uh, as we mature as a community, we want to make sure that we continue to be responsive to the changing landscape. And certainly over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen a lot of change in our community. We've seen a lot of change in the environment, right? The, the retail landscape, we've seen a lot of change in how, you know, the, the preferences and values that people have and how they approach retail development or what kinds of developments that they have and that they want to see. And a lot has changed. So as I go through this, we also want to make sure that we um, capture your thoughts and input, not only on the, the information we're presenting, but we do have your information back from the uh, council work so uh, shop that we had back on June 11th. And so uh, we've, we've tried to make sure that we've uh, incorporated that into the design document. And, and certainly if the design document isn't the right place for capturing that input, there might be other documents, other regulatory documents, like the zoning code that might be appropriate to do that. So we want to make sure that we continue to explore, the, explore that. So on this presentation today, I, I want to spend some time talking about where do the design guidelines fit. Uh, admittedly, the uh, development process can be a little confusing. It's layered, um, you know, and it's, uh, a very, there's a very discrete position for design guidelines as, as opposed to rezoning or entitlement. They have a very different uh, stage in the process. And I just want to explain how design guidelines fit in. And then what I, I want to spend the rest of the time talking about uh, the draft community design guidelines that we have and talk to you about some of those areas of emphasis. The uh, intention would be that um, after providing this information tonight, we're, we would continue to work through the process. I would like to come back in front of the council and present the proposed changes prior to asking you to take action on the document. So that would happen early next year, okay? Before I move on, I do wanna uh, note some acknowledgements uh, and not, uh, some assistance that we've received in putting the draft together. Um, this is an internal update that's been led by the planning department, um, including Lori Bieber in the audience. She's been uh, serving as our, as our lead on this project. 
there's been a lot of effort expended, a lot of people involved, and it all, again, stems from the input and the guidance that, that you, the council, have provided us. We've also been in front of, uh, the, you know, we've talked with the city manager's office, we've also been in front of uh, three boards and commissions twice. You know, you can see them on the screen, planning and zoning, design review, to talk about specific aspects of design um, in their areas. And then we've also put together a few um, internal technical teams to look at different aspects of design review, whether it's the streetscape or whether it's open space and connectivity. And you can see the names, they run the gamut from not only our department of planning, but also we want to recognize those in engineering and parks, uh, neighborhood services, and also water services staff. They've all been involved and we've met a lot during this process so far. So first let's talk about the development process, where the design guidelines fit in. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna show this graphic one more. I think I show this a lot, don't I? The mothership, <laughs> as we call it. But it's important to know where kind of how all the relationships fit in. And I won't spend too much time on this one, but again, the general plan is the, uh, uh, provides the high level policy guidance about uh, the future development of the city. And it has chapters around it that align with your livability goals. And one of those is smart growth, right? That's one of the chapters, that's one of the, the um, uh, livability elements. So we implement the livability elements through the various uh, documents that we have at the city. Now this, the documents in the outer ring are, are certainly not exhaustive. There are more that were shown here, but for example, in the smart growth realm, how we implement that is we use tools like the subdivision regulations, the zoning ordinance, and what we're going to talk about tonight, the design review manual. That's one of the documents that we use to implement it. Okay, just a quick uh, on the purpose and intent of our design guidelines. The purpose broadly is to elevate uh, the identity and character of our community. We want to promote pl uh, interesting places with good quality architecture. And you know, it's about building community pride and cementing our reputation as a livable community. That's what it comes down to. And altogether, our design guidelines really are a statement of what we expect in our community. So the projects, they always start from the vision of a landowner or a developer or an architect. And our job is to understand that vision and use our standards to best shape and guide the project to meet our design expectations, the community's design expectations. Now over the years, uh, we said we've established a uh, collaborative ethic in how we arrive at a design solution. Um, we understand that each site has its own context, right? What's, what's around it matters and how, what the design solution will be. It has its own constraints and opportunities. There's also functional differences in different types of land uses. We certainly can't treat a retail store the same way we would a, a concrete tilt up uh, industrial warehouse. They have different functional differences and, and, and differences about how they're laid out. And we also have to acknowledge that there is multiple solutions to design questions. So there's, there's never a one size fits all. That's why there's a certain amount of flexibility uh, built into the design manual. We have hard requirements, but we also have some flexibility built in because we understand that the design solutions vary depending on where you are and what the project is. All right, since I've been here since the beginning, let me talk about the evolution of design guidance real briefly. Um, our first design manual was adopted in 1997. Um, and it was an attempt to provide a minimum baseline of expectations. And this was a scoring system. So we actually scored buildings, we scored sites, so you'd have to get a minimum score in certain areas. And I think it was, it was, a, it was a great starting structure, but I think what we learned and what we found out is that, boy, you sure can't quantify good design. You might have a passing score, but maybe you weren't completely satisfied with the result. It's just hard to quantify design. And so in 2008, uh, we adopted the current version of the design manual. It's, it's very comprehensive, it's qualitative. We adopted it um, within the policies uh, some specific use guidelines. For example, we have policies that pertain to big box development, drive-throughs and gas stations and utility boxes. And we also have um, special sections. Uh, we have a section for Old Town and we have a section for uh, Lake Pleasant Parkway. So it was very comprehensive. And so what we're doing now is we're working on the third version that we're now terming the community design guidelines. So there we go. So real briefly, applicability, where do the design guidelines, where, where do we apply them? Well, we apply them on the commercial industrial stage. Any new construction has to go through design review or if a uh, building is existing and they're making a material change to the facade or they're adding an addition, it has to go through design review as well. We wanna make sure it continues to fit within the, the site and the surrounding context. On the residential side, all multifamily has to go through design review. On the single family side, we're looking at uh, developments over 10 lots because those are the lots that then require common open space and, and, and so forth. And we also require design review later in the process for a subdivision when they come forward and they uh, want to submit uh, their, their 
they're standard plan packages, so we want to make sure that we have enough diversity in the architecture, that the placement of these on the in the subdivision, that there's enough diversity in how it's placed, and that we're um, got the right uh, streetscape alignment there. So it does come into play twice there. In terms of exemptions, um, tenant improvements. So anything within a building isn't subject to design review because we just look at the outside of it. And certainly uh, schools and governmental entities, they have their own, um, their own missions, um, and so it doesn't apply there. On the residential side then, um, anything less than 10 lots, it doesn't currently apply, individual single family homes, and certainly, you know, we're not in the business of really dictating what's in somebody's backyard. So design review doesn't apply to the, you know, the various structures and sport courts. The only proviso there is if you have an accessory structure that's large, you know, a big RV structure that's over 300 square feet, you're going to need a permit anyway, or it's over nine feet in height, we do require a design review evaluation. And essentially what we're trying to do is make sure that the building color is in line with the, the home there, and it's not out of character there. So it, in that respect, it does have to go through design review. Okay, how is the design review manual used? And so this is actually a two-part exhibit. I'll get to the second part in a minute. But what we call entitlement or the rezoning process, um, you know, that's when somebody will have an idea and what they want to do on a piece of property. They either have the zoning in place or they're coming to the city and the council to ask for a change in zoning. And so what we're doing in that process is that's the point in time that we're setting the regulations. We're trying to establish what are the allowable uses on the site. You know, what is the density? What is the building height? What are the setbacks? Um, what are the engineering and fire requirements that are already fixed? These things are fixed and in place before we bring the project to design review, okay? So we all, we establish the regulatory environment at the zoning stage, either existing zoning or through a rezoning action. The next stage is after that's set in place, somebody will bring in, if it's a commercial or multifamily, they'll bring in what's called a site plan review. If it's single family, they'll bring in a preliminary plat. And so at that level, that's when we employ design review because we've already got the regulations set in place now we're employing our design review standards to shape the development. And we're gonna look at the way the site is laid out. We're gonna look at the, the architecture of all the buildings on the site. We're gonna look at the theming and try to ensure that there's a, a good sense of place. And, and in a minute I'll talk about fit, form, and feeling. That's really what design review comes down to. And then later in the stage after we've approved the concept at site plan, they'll then submit for construction plans. And in that regard, if like I said, if there's a facade change, we'll see them again at design review or on the single family side, before they uh, get their permits for individual homes, they have to get a design review approved for the, the, the single family um, plan package, as it were. So really, uh, not to be too esoteric, but the design guidelines really come down to three components. Really, it's about fit, form, and feeling. Uh, fit, this is the site layout. This is uh, the function and use of space. So you can see a building on the site and all the different uh, items that are part of that site and that the fit of that building in relation to the site. The form is the next part, and that's really the physical attributes of the space. Um, architecture in this example, this is, uh, you can see the building has moved up to the street. We're talking about a low-lying building with extensive shading. So it's got a different form than a building perhaps on, on Bell Road or Grand Avenue. So that's what we mean when we say form. And then the feeling, that's all the theming, and that's what kind of meaning and what kind of emotion does the space conjure up. You know, in this example, perhaps it looks festive and it looks uh, energetic, as opposed to maybe a different example where we're looking for more of a muted or more of a neighborly uh, type of character. But that's really what design review comes down to, is fit, form, and feeling here. I think it's important to also note that there are other factors that affect um, the layout or uh, building design. Um, I, I do want to mention the engineering and public work standards that they have in place. These are regulations, right? We have regulations for grading and drainage or how retention occurs or how access occurs. That all feeds into what ultimately the site, the design of the site or how it looks. We also have fire department standards as you would expect, right? Codes for hydrant locations, site design, that'll all help inform what that uh, result will be. And, and, and so working with the development community, it's, it's truly a balance between uh, the project vision put forth by the applicant or architect, our adopted codes and design guidelines, and certainly there's always a market reality to things. Um, the types of uses that we're talking about and their functional needs, that's part of the market reality that we have to work with as we employ our design guidelines. So before I jump into 
our current guidelines that we're working on, I want to just talk about a couple of examples in practice just to kind of um, nail home the idea of where design review fits in. So here's an example. This happens to be 83rd Marketplace, 83rd and Happy Valley. So it went through a rezoning process when they were asking for a change in zoning. Um, the, um, this is, again, the stage where we set the regulatory environment, and there's two parts to it, right? It's, there's establishing the standards, and there's going through the public process. And so during the rezone process, there's a, there's a neighborhood outreach component. So in this example, uh, you may recall neighbors, they didn't want to see this corner evolve into a typical corner. Um, they didn't want to see auto-serving uses at the corner. Um, they wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, it looked very different and was distinctive. So as we worked through that process, there were conditions of approval that became part of what was the regulatory scheme that was approved. For example, we, didn't, uh, we prohibited gas stations. We didn't allow... We had a limit to how many uh, drive-throughs we allowed on site. We certainly didn't permit them at the corner of this development. And we also expanded the buffer, the buffer considerations and the access requirements. So those became part of the regulatory environment in addition to the other things that, that are on the screen that we establish at zoning, you know, the uses, the landscape buffers, and so forth. So that gets set at the zoning and entitlement stage. And then when the project came in for site plan review, and, and we have approved the, the first and second phase of site plan, that's when we try to use the design guidelines to actually shape the development within the regulatory environment that's already been set. So for example, we have guidelines that said, you know what, we want to break up the parking field. We don't want a dominant parking field at the street. So we want buildings embracing the street. We want buildings to be laid out in a fashion that takes advantage of the, the, the viewscapes of the preserves and provides opportunities for public space, and so we have that between the two buildings at the corner. Um, we also wanted, it was very important that we have four-sided architecture if we're going to push buildings to the street. You know, there's certainly there are examples in the city and other places where the execution wasn't, wasn't quite as desired. We want to make sure we have four-sided architecture and we're not looking at the backs of buildings and they're, they're well appointed and that they have a, a good colors and material scheme to go with that. We also want to make sure the buildings have appropriate, we call it articulation, but essentially we don't want boxy buildings, right? We want buildings to have enough movement in the plane and enough uh, movement in the roof line, enough undulation in the roof line so that we create interesting buildings and interesting sites here. So those are types, some of the types of uh, elements that we're going to push the developer within the regulatory environment to uh, promote a better, a better site layout. All right, so I'm going to talk next about the uh, design guidelines, but before I go there, let me pause. Is there any questions on some of the information I've presented so far? Council? I have a question. Council Member Binsbacher? Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I have this design right here made me think of, you know, how we require open space in our developments. Is the requirement the same for commercial developments? Um, Mayor, uh, Council Member uh, Binsbacher. We, um, within our desert lands ordinance, we do require a certain amount of open space that's part of that. But within our design guidelines, we also require gathering areas or public space. And there isn't a percentage that's allocated with that, but we do require that and we do require that it be activated. So using those guidelines, we are able to push them to provide that, that corner treatment as it were. Okay, so I'm gonna... Chris, is, is oh. gathering space, the addition of gathering space new for this, for this? Um, segment of design guidelines? Mayor, council members, uh, we, we do have, uh, so there is policies today for, for public space and gathering areas. I think the changes that you'll hear me talk about is the activation and, the, and where they're located and the types of um, amenities that we want employed so that they're a lot more activated than just, you know, a patio space somewhere. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference there. Thank you. Yes, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chris, um, so, so with open space, uh, another question. So what about connectivity, uh, not with this particular project, but say you had a project next door to this. Um, is, there, is there part of the uh, policy to have like connectivity so that if you wanted to go from this shopping center to the next development, you didn't have to get in your car and drive around the corner, you could go with a little bit of ease between the two facilities? Uh, Mayor and Councilmember Edwards, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we always are trying to push for connectivity, either, um, you know, vehicular connectivity, and, and sometimes that's, you have, to have a, you have to have a willing neighbor to, to allow that. We always try to push for pedestrian connectivity as well. 
um, through uh, you know adjacent sites and through other points of interest. And so we try to push the site in a manner that it um, puts in place those opportunities for those connections. So certainly we're always looking to do that, but you know that sometimes through the rezoning process it can be it can be challenging when we have neighbors that may not they may object to a certain connection point, and that's where we, as we look at this project, we have to look at it in a manner, um, you know, this connectivity, walkability, it's all part of community health, right? A healthy community, being able to walk to certain areas, being able to uh, access different areas. And so it's all part of that evaluation. I think collectively we have to look at when we're looking at a rezone or down the line through a design review action. Okay, the, uh, this slide outlines the organization of the draft document. Um, one of the new things that we're, we're adding to it is a new chapter, and this is a chapter called Design Excellence, and we've provided a copy of that chapter in your, in your, in your packet. And I think it's important to have a, um, a chapter in Design Excellence. What that do does is this is a statement of how this community defines design excellence. How do we achieve design excellence? What does it look like? And what is our philosophy and values? Okay, it's it's the principles uh, that form the foundation of all the design guidelines that are, that are in the document. And, and we've got a lot of very specific and detailed guidelines. Um, you know, we're not trying to be esoteric in this chapter, but uh, it does. Uh, but when users ask us, what do we stand for? What is this? What do you mean by community design in Peoria? This is a chapter that stands alone and says this is what we're talking about. These are the types of features and amenities that we're talking about when we look at um, excellence in design. So. Um, the document starts with a, or the chapter rather, starts with a guiding framework, and it has several components of, of, in the guiding framework. Context, place-based solutions. So we want distinctive settings that are compatible with the area. Sense of identity is important in this community. It's a recognition that development should enhance the community. Uh, we want interesting development that has its own flavor and it's not repetitious, right? We don't want monotonous development throughout the community. We want some distinction there. Community by design. Um, we want innovative design. That's important because we want to continue to move forward, but we don't want to compromise quality, and that's important. Uh, connectivity. To your point, Vice Mayor Edwards, to your point, connectivity is very important. We're always looking for ways to broaden access to the community. And again, as I mentioned, healthy communities are all about promoting multiple forms of access and multiple modes to get to a location. Walkability, I think, is self-evident there. Also, sustainability. We want to make sure that we encourage practices that minimize the footprint on the environment. So I don't have a slide for it, but there is a, in the next section in your packet is how do we achieve design excellence? So there's a lot of discussion, uh, more specific discussion on how do we achieve it, and that's part of that section. I think it's just important to, that we have just that overarching um, statement, chapter that really, um, I guess, provides guidance for the development community. All right, I'm gonna go through some of the chapters, and what I'm gonna do is as I go through each one, you're gonna see some repetition in terms of the topics. I'm not gonna go through each topic, but I will pause and talk about some of the um, areas that we're highlighting. In the, and so the, with the residential chapter, this is single family and multifamily. So you can see on the screen, these are all the sub areas that we look at. We look at the entry design, how you enter a community, what's the character of the development, what's the theming package. Where are we placing buildings on the site? And we look at the specific architecture of all the buildings there. On the single family front, uh, we wanna make sure that uh, we don't have um, uh, single family homes that are overly garage dominant. So we actually have policies in place that limit the percentage of a plane that can be within the garage. I mean, things like that are, are employed there just so we have a little bit of diversity. Landscaping and shade, how that's employed on a site, uh, the building colors and materials, richness in colors, richness in building materials. We wanna try to promote uh, timeless design if we can, and then access and connectivity. So these are some topical areas that you're gonna see um, repeated in all the different sections. It's how we go about it, how we employ them, are all different. Again, based on the context and the land use there. So some specific things that we're looking at for residential, we're looking to, uh, I use the word recalibrate, but recalibrate the amount of active open space that we require in single family and also on the multifamily side. So single family, Right now, there's a minimum number based on the lot size. We're looking to, we're reviewing that, that open space uh, amount. A lot of times it just aligns with the, re with the retention basin. Maybe that's not appropriate. Maybe it needs to be more, more expansive than that. So we're, we're looking to, uh, to strengthen that part of it. On the multifamily side, uh, we have minimum open space that's required based on the unit mix. Well, 
Um, we're, we're certainly looking to strengthen that as well, but we also need to recognize that as we go forward in the community, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the growth of our community, there might be some uh, more urban um, executions, right? Uh, I think we saw one at a council meeting last month with the Converge was a more of an urban execution. So is the, the amount of open space as important as the, the amenity package that's provided with it? So you're, you're in much more dense locations. And so I think we have to recognize just a little difference there between that and maybe a, an outlying location in a more suburban location. So we wanna modify the types of uh, amenities that they have to have in place in these open space areas. I mean, I think it's no longer adequate to just have a tot lot in a, in a, in a ramada in a retention basin. I don't think that's adequate. So I think we need to uh, strengthen and, and, and address the types of, different types of amenities that we expect in these open space areas. I think that's important. Um, building placement and also trying to improve and strengthen the product distinction. I think going back to the June 11th uh, council workshop, that was one of the comments you made. You know, we, you want to see more distinctive development. You want to see different development. And I think we need to put the policies in place that, that promote that and push that. And also, I know we've had in the past uh, discussions about, particularly on the residential side, about uh, block length and how our streets look. And certainly we need to, we, we are updating, uh, you know, maximum block length and the layout of streets and the traffic common provisions that we would employ uh, for those street segments. So these are just some of the highlights in that area. Let's go on to commercial and mixed use. Um, again, I should mention here with commercial and mixed use. In the current version, we, we lump um, industrial and commercial together. And I mentioned earlier on, they have two very different executions and very different functions. So we split them out. So here we're just talking about commercial and mixed use here. And so you can see a lot of the same topical areas. And uh, you know some of the areas that we want to emphasize in this section include, we want to strengthen requirements for gathering spaces. We want to make sure that the, um, there's stronger language about where these gathering spaces are and the types of elements that would help activate these areas. I think mean, before it was a, a menu of options and they weren't all very necessarily very strong. And so we want to make sure that that we have the, the strongest types of elements in these gathering spaces, then they're appropriately situated so that they're not some, uh, you know, placed in the back, that they're, they're centralized and they, they satisfy a function as part of that development there. So we wanna emphasize also uh, theming elements. I think um, there's, there's a council interest in promoting arts in the community, so we wanna make sure that we're promoting arts. We're not just asking for it, but maybe there's stronger language in terms of um, um, trying to integrate it within developments. Maybe there's a couple classifications of, of uh, theming elements and we wanna put more of an emphasis on promotion of art in its various forms. Also wanna strengthen connection points from adjacent uses, uses and that goes to connectivity, pedestrian and vehicular connectivity, but also recognizes that, again, if we wanna, con if we wanna promote ourselves as a more um, healthy community, it's important that we make sure that sites are always situated and always evaluated with with the next development that's going to, is going to occur with the next development. Now we have those connections in place to establish those, those points of connection. And then I think we need to bolster our drive-through screening requirements. So this is one of those things where, um, you know, whether you like it or not, drive-throughs are part of our landscape, right? They're part of the, the United States landscape. They're, they're everywhere. And so a lot of people utilize them, especially in the post-COVID condition, we're seeing heavier emphasis on drive-through locations. And so we wanna make sure that we've got a appropriate screening and so that the, the, the drive-through isn't the dominant uh, component um, on a site and that it's appropriately screened and perhaps um, appropriately situated as well. So I think we need to bolster those requirements as well. And then the next section, uh, business, commerce, and employment or industrial. That's, that's really the industrial section here. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's important that, uh, and, and this is one of the things where we had difficulty in the past because we've got some very specific um, guidelines for commercial, for example, and they don't always work too well when, you, when you've got an industrial execution, when you're looking at a tilt, concrete tilt-up building and you're asking the developer to employ windows around the building and lots of roofline uh, undulation. It doesn't work for their functional needs, and I think we need to recognize that there's a, there's a distinction between the two types of uh, development types, and so uh, through that, we've um, employed standards that recognize that there's a clear distinction between what I'll call the public realm, and that's all the areas where the public has access, right? Not behind the gates where the trucks are, but where they have access and also um, understand that buildings have a, have, have a functional purpose. And so we need to adjust our standards to really apply better to those, to those different needs there. 
And then the other one, we're going to continue to have an Old Town core chapter. So, um, you know, we have this chapter in place as we see redevelopment in Old Town, as we see new development in Old Town. We want to make sure we have the right standards to guide it because certainly the standards that we have for typical commercial or, or residential may not work well because it's got a very different character in Old Town. So some of the areas that we're looking at that we've been working with our Historic Preservation and Design Review Board about is trying to dis strengthen the distinctiveness of the area. And we want to certainly uh, employ and promote gateway treatments and, and where those gateways should occur, signage and, more, and, and different types of signage, art and other visual cues to really separate um, Old Town apart. We also want to recognize that the public realm, the area along the sidewalks, um, really kind of provide an outdoor space for us, just like, like I get, uh, oh, what's the coffee shop underneath there? Driftwood Coffee Shop, right? That kind of acts and feels like an outdoor room. It's a community space. And we want those types of community spaces. And so we want to emphasize, you know, not only the form of moving buildings to the street line and, and a streetscape, but also um, that we have the right uh, amenities and a right um, execution along that, that streetscape. And then also it's important, you know, we've got some properties that are undeveloped in Old Town. And we're going to see new development someday. And we want to make sure that as we see new development that it's authentic. And what I mean by that is we want to allow some distinction. We understand that, um, you know, a newer building is going to look different than an older building. But we also want to not lose the history of the area. And we want to make sure that as we have new buildings and they have, you know, a newer, a newer distinction, we want to make sure that we um, continue to maintain architectural influences in the building that are authentic to the area so that there is a combination of the old and new and there's a great fit for it. I think that's important to have that and, and perhaps where the standards don't, uh, don't quite get to today as we have them. And the next thing I want to talk about, and the, and the final thing is, uh, and this is really a phase two as part of this project, I want to strengthen the role of the design review board. So um, in the past years, um, you might recall we had two design review boards. We had a design standards board, and we had a design review appeals board. Drab, right? <laughs> and the design standards board, uh, that was composed of citizens, and they helped us um, build the design standards. That was their, their job, was to build design standards. Um, and then we had a design review appeals board, and to the extent there was ever an appeal, they would go to the design review appeals board. They were comprised of professionals, right? Architects, engineers, and so forth. And so we reconstituted our design review board a couple of years ago. Uh, we combined it to one board, and now it's a combination of professionals and, uh, and citizens on that board. And so that board's been in place for a couple of years. We've been meeting regularly. Um, they've got a lot more meetings in front of them, but we've been meeting. They're a great group. And I think it's important, though, and this is why I think we need to strengthen the role. Right now, um, they would only see a project if there's an appeal, right? In, in other words, um, the staff and the, and the developer can't come to an agreement on how we're employing a policy or how we're asking for a change. And then they would, they would go to the DRB and they would make the decision. The reason that hasn't happened very often is the developer is very unlikely to want to remove the project from their hands or the staff hands and put it in the hands of a third party, right? So that hasn't happened very often. But I think it's important going forward that we identify an appropriate threshold of projects. We can look at it by the type of project, the size of the project, and, it, and I think it's, it's, it's a good practice to have a third party, like a, like a design review board, to provide that initial input on it, you know, perhaps at first review. Now, what I want to make sure we don't, we don't do is that we don't create this um, onerous process that um, you know, it, it unduly affects the, the progression of projects in the community. I think what we're trying to do is get good feedback on projects that really impact the community. And so that's what we'll have to work through as a design review board and as a, as a council is what are those projects that are impactful that should go through a uh, design review um, uh, look uh, in, front of the, in front of the design review board. Certainly it's not every project. Some projects are small and certainly others are a lot bigger. So that's what we're looking at there and that's really a, a phase two after we get through the design guidelines. Mayor and Council, I just want to, my last piece now is talk about the project schedule and where we've been. So, so we had the City Council workshop on the 11th. We've been working on the design standards internally, uh, you know, most of this year. Um, we've now gone through two study sessions uh, with our design review board, Planning and Zoning Commission and HPC. We um, have, uh, we're going to continue to work on the standards, utilize the input we received tonight. We're looking to have some open uh, houses with the community. Um, the first open houses or information sessions will be specifically on Old Town Core and residential sections. We're going to invite the 
home builders, the multifamily association, we've already had some contact. We wanna make sure that uh, they're comfortable with the, the new direction we're going and some of the new standards. And then uh, later the next month, we're gonna have a second uh, series of open houses and that's more on the commercial and mixed use and employment section realm. Again, having discussions with those, with those parties. The objective would be to, to kind of get all this folded together, come back in front of the city, the, uh, city council in uh, January of next year, have the next study session. I would, I would talk to you about what we heard through that engagement process, talk to you about what are the, what are the, the, the large changes that we're proposing. Um, and then the DRB, they're actually the body that makes the formal recommendation. So instead of planning and zoning commission, it'll be the DRB, and then we would look to come back to council in February for your, your final consideration. Mm -hmm. Mayor and Council, that's all I have, and I'd be happy to take any questions or input. Thank you. Council Member Patena. Thank you, Mayor. So, Chris, uh, back in uh, June, we had a City Council workshop, and you talked about, uh, I want to talk specifically about building design. You talked about uh, timeless designs, which I, what I thought was a pretty interesting concept. Um, is that the type of information that would go into this manual, uh, talking about uh, timeless uh, designs? Mayor, Councilor Patena, absolutely. Particularly when you look at the design excellence, you know, when we're talking about um, richness of materials and designs that are not just for today, but they're for, we're, we're trying, you know, the timeless is one of those terms that's hard to encapsulate, but what we're talking about is designs that, um, you know, that, that will not age out in two years, that we can see for a longer period of time. Okay. So we're really looking about the quality and richness of it. And then my second question is, how, how will you, how will you be able to convey this message to the developers that this is something that the city is interested in doing? Uh, Mayor, Councilor Pantena, that's a, that's a great uh, point, great question. We do this, we have several conversations with developers all the time, every day, whether it happens at the pre-application process or when projects come in, um, we're constantly having that, that discussion and we have to, you know, our staff has to be well versed in, in the things that we're looking for and we have to have those conversations with the developer, starting with the design excellence, what our expectations are, and how we expect to move through the different uh, design components. Thank you. Um, Chris, I've got a question. I, I noticed at one point, I think we were talking about residential when you um, uh, called our attention to landscaping and shade, but overall, is there a way to look at this design review guideline and, and find out where the city stands on its shade requirements? for yeah. all various kinds of projects. Mayor, council member, the, the answer to that question is probably in, in two places. I think part of the answer is in design review. We are always pushing for more shade and shade in the right place, right? Um, not just shade for shade's sake, but right in the right places. And it can be done through trees or it can be done through man-made elements. And we're try always trying to maximize shade. Additionally, when I talked about regulations, right? We also have on our work plan to take another uh, look at our landscaping standards, our landscaping code. So we need to look at that and make sure that we have um, standards that reflect today's environment, right tree, right place, and that we have the, the right type of expectation along our streetscapes. That's more of the regulation side, but certainly in the design review, it also has a hand in this as well. So in other cities, I know that they have various requirements for parking lots, such as grocery store parking lots and so forth, that might require a lot more trees than we require. And so are we making a change in these design guidelines to require more shade in parking lots? Um, uh, Mayor, council members, um, I, I think what you're referring to is the, the regulations that we have in our landscape code and parking code about where, where we can, because that's more prescriptive, right? How many trees do you have to have on the site? You know, you have to have a, tr a landscape island, at so many so many stalls. That's the prescriptive part of it. The art is in the design review, the expectations we have for where shade is located and 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 and, and how it's functional, its functional feel on the site. But certainly, I'm hearing you in the on the regulatory side. We need to definitely strengthen our regulations for shade and, and landscaping. I think we need to, to strengthen those regulations for shade and landscaping, and then make them adhere to what our um, subjective fit and feeling might be That's in right. the <laughs> design guidelines, making all of those work together. We definitely need to make a larger presence for shade in our city. Anyone else? Council Member Vinsbacher? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Chris, this, I hope I can get this out right. I'm thinking about um, infill development area. So where we have, whether it's 
the old town area or even P83, we bring in new developments and the designs and the colors and everything are so current. Um, how do we deal with uh, structures that aren't in that area to create a flow, you know, so that the new ones, I, I guess like with the residential areas, we have the neighborhood revitalization where we help to keep the uh, homes and the neighborhoods current. Is there anything like that for existing or older uh, business communities? Mayor, uh, Councilmember Bensbacher, that's a, that's a great question. And I tell you, infill development is, is, is tough, right? Yeah. And it depends on where you're at. I mean, if, if you're talking about the P83 area, we already have through the general plan. This is where that connection to the general plan occurs. We have a land use designation that talks about the, the environment and the urban form that we're expecting there. We're looking for something, projects that are more urban, that are pushed to the street, that um, have energy and in, in, around them. And so that's kind of our, our guidance for the P83 area. Other infra areas, they're tough because you might have a development that's been there for, you know, decades, right? And then now you have a, a new piece of that development that's redeveloping, a new pad. And so, you know, it, when, we, when we look at these projects, the, the guidance isn't um, make sure that new building is exactly the way, fits in, in, in a compatible with the way it was 40 years ago. We certainly want them to maintain influences that, are, that can kind of bring it together so it doesn't look like it's out of place but we're also looking for them to update the site. And so that's where that, that balance you have with trying to bring the site up, but also not, but not lose those connections with the other buildings on the site. Now we're, that's where it gets complicated, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Thank yeah. you. And when we look at um, planning and zoning, I mean, zoning um, cases that we're talking about, he always includes a transition statement in there to talk about how it fits in with its um, current with the current um, development in that area. That's correct. That's, that's right. very helpful. Yep, absolutely. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you very much. That presentation was very interesting, and I'm looking forward to seeing more about design guidelines. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Tyne? Great. Thank you, Mayor. That is all we have. And as you see, we have a, a thoughtful process to really engage some of our boards and then come back to you with that information. So looking forward to the uh, providing new results. Thank you. Thank you. And we are adjourned until our 6 p.m. meeting. <laughs> <laughs>